This episode of Around the Layout is brought to you by Weather My Trains. Hey, are you like me and the thought of doing a DIY weathering job on an expensive engine leaves you in fear? It's time to call in Rob Arsenault at Weather My Trains. Do what thousands of satisfied customers have done and let Rob help you notch up the realism on your layout with beautifully detailed weathering on your locomotives and rolling stock. To see what Rob can do for you, check out his website at weathermytrains.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Around the Layout, where model railroaders come to tell their story. My name is Ray Arnott. So glad you could join us. Joining me tonight, originally from Chicago, Illinois, now living just outside Los Angeles, California, Michael Gross. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ray. Good to be a part of it. Thanks so uh, much. I'm, I'm so thrilled to have you here. There's just something really cool to me that, you know, somebody of uh, a celebrity status as yourself can call themselves a model railroader. And it's just really cool to know that. I mean, I think the hobby itself is kind of a, I know, it can be a lone wolf kind of closeted thing. But when you find out, you know, here's, here's an eighties TV dad that loves railroading and model railroading. It just, it really makes it kind of just feel that much cooler. Well, I think, um, you know, in some ways the world of model railroading is not unlike the world of art. Uh, and and acting in acting we create basically is is acting is an escape from reality right we we are creating uh, somebody once said uh, I forget who that art is uh, actually a kind of form of protest because right. you create either through your music or your poetry or your plays or the books you write or the films you make. Um, the world that you want to see right that's better than the real world and more structured than the real world and uh, uh, perhaps kinder than the real world <laughs> and uh, uh, that you that has a narrative that maybe has a happy ending or at least tries to make some sense of life and I find model railroading is I guess I could describe it as a form of protest, too. It's saying, excuse me, I'm making this world the way I want to see it. This, for me, that world is 1954, right. summer, Kansas, Wheat Rush, yeah. uh, Branch Line, Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe. And yeah. this is the perfect world for me. And thank you very much. I'm the creator. I am its God. Yeah, <laughs> and, that's right. <laughs> and uh, so it could be seen as a lot of art, like uh, a form of protest, really. This is the way the world is as I see it and as I want it. Thank you very much. And you don't have a choice <laughs> either. <laughs> I think that word protest is actually very well chosen because it is. And I know you're, you're mentioning ATSF, you know, what you guess we would call a fallen flag, but but not in 1954 on your layout. There's no fallen flag there. And I think there's you know, there's a multitude of ways to kind of protest the change, protest uh, modernization. There's just a lot of things that are a, a part of that. So that's that's very well uh, uh, noted there. Mm -hmm. So I want to get to know, we, we obviously know you from, you know, 171 episodes of Family Time the entire Tremor series, off-Broadway, on-Broadway, and then, of course, the pinnacle of your career when you appeared alongside Jordan Smith and Jason Schron in the Rapido YouTube video that yeah. you did with those guys. <laughs> that must have been the highlight of your career. What, those, a, what a blast you guys must have had doing one, that. They, they, well, I always loved, uh, I love Jason's insanity. Yes. You know, and uh, it's one of the few commercial ventures that I will actually watch from beginning to end because I know it's going to be insane. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's, and you know to to take to take the hobby seriously without taking yourself too seriously is just wonderful. Yeah. And it's the way I approach my work too. I mean I uh, I love what I do for a living but I I don't take myself too seriously. I consider myself fortunate as opposed to the greatest actor on the planet, you know, and um, and I know that, you know, I can be replaced by somebody else in a moment and some days am uh, replaceable. <laughs> oh, mostly, most of us are. 
So right. I don't take myself too seriously. And I love that uh, Jason and the people at Rapido are just having the time of their lives. They're being silly. Yes. And uh, we are all, when it comes down to it, I'm playing with trains. I'm playing with my own little world. And I take it seriously, quote unquote, with prototypical operations and things like that and uh, and uh, a level of detail. But it's not my complete. It's just a part of life. It's not all of my life. That's right. And That's right. and I know it's 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 a way to to pass the time, and make me feel better without uh, without taking it too seriously. There's plenty of else, plenty of other things in the world to take seri- much more seriously than what I what I do with my hobby hours. Yeah, absolutely, and and like you said, even even those that have you know Jason Schron and in Rapido, that is their livelihood, but yet they still have a lot of fun with it. So oh. it kind of puts that all into perspective. And boy, I could just that that video was hilarious. I saw that, and uh, I just one, I was like, how the heck did they get him to agree to do that? And then two, it was just, but it was a lot of fun. And, and boy, it, uh, uh, if anybody hasn't caught that, I'm going to put the the link in the show notes. It's definitely hey, worth good, a watch good. or three or four. It's a good laugh. It's um, um, it's and it's based on truth too because Jason said, "How do we do this?" And I said, "People are always mistaking me for Alan Alda." <laughs> I said, "You know, I mean, you know, they they get the they say they know you and then they get the name wrong and you go, oh yeah. brother, this is nuts." Right. So I said, "Why don't we do something with that?" <laughs> <laughs> It was a blast for sure. <laughs> so, so let's let's get kind of into it and in, in, a little bit sure. about your background in, in model rearing because I'm excited to hear what you've got built and and because I don't know much about your layout, so you're going to get to tell me that. But first, why don't you tell me a little bit about how you got started in the model railroad hobby? Sure. First of all, um, you mentioned earlier I grew up in Chicago, uh, the railroad capital of the United States. Certainly, right. Right. Uh, I never lived further than one block away my house was never further than one block away uh from a a railroad track in chicago uh and i lived in a couple of places i lived well basically two homes and both of them were within one block of a railroad (laughs) track of a working railroad track Uh, and so i saw uh my my first one was along the uh, chicago northwestern commuter line the northwest commuter line out to from Chicago out to uh, Crystal Lake and Harvard and things like that for anybody who knows the the Northwestern. So out, out in their north Northwestern line. And so as a child before age 10, I saw, my golly, I think I may have seen 70 trains pass a day, wow. morning and evening, particularly in those rush hours. Uh, it was huge. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, steam locomotives. And uh, mm-hmm. I can just remember the... Uh, you know the clank of the side rods and those computer uh, c- commuters uh, swaying in those old cars. Well before the days of the gallery, the two-level gallery cars, yeah, uh, utility coaches basically. So I remember that, and I remember mom being unable to put out the laundry uh, except. Uh, between morning and evening rush hours because the smoke <laughs> <laughs> the smoke would dirty the laundry on the line. Oh, wow. Uh, that's, that's how that's close, close we were to the tracks. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that's close. <laughs> that's close. Yeah. So, um, and probably most of all, <clears throat> yes, there were always trains that were just passing the house. Mm-hmm. But uh, my grandfather, uh, to whom I was very close, worked uh, 56 years for the Ashes and Topeka and Santa Fe Railway. Wow. And his father before him was a boiler maker for both the Santa Fe and the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy. Wow. And uh, reportedly was a great boiler maker when he was sober. Um, and um, the reason he went back and forth between the two railroads is every time he got a paycheck, he'd go on a drunk and uh, not show up for work. <laughs> And they'd fire him and he'd just go back to the other railroad, which would rehire him because he was such a good boiler maker. So he managed to, (laughs) he had quite a reputation as a rebel rouser and a, and a, and a drunk, unfortunately. So we've that, that, that history in the family. Um, And my grandfather, by the way, his son, as a result of that, never touched a drop. He was a teetotaler because he had seen, he had seen the pain it had brought to his own family. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, 
and uh, his father going on terrible drunks. So, um, awful benders. So, uh, but he was a good enough boiler maker that both railroads kept hiring him back. That's amazing. Uh, and for short periods of time until he'd get a paycheck and then off he'd go. So um, he was a boilermaker and apparently a very good one because they kept hiring him in spite of his disability. Right. Um, so he re- he retired from the, uh, uh, finally from the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe in Kansas. And mm-hmm. uh, like most boilermakers in those days, because they didn't protect themselves, he was... Uh, as, as as my grandmother would say, as deaf as a post, yep. uh, because uh, they, you know, the, he was inside of big steel things while people were hammering rivets into it, so his hearing was gone. And uh, but his his son, my grandfather, uh, went into the family business and worked for fifty six years for the Santa Fe, and I was very close to him, uh, loved him madly, yeah, uh, and. Um, uh, idolized him, in fact, uh, wanted to be him yeah. some days. Uh, it was a very close relationship, and I came to associate what he did for a living with the man himself, and um, and so loved trains. I was a goner. Let's just put yeah. it that way. Right? Had he had he been a, a, a <laughs> had I lived in uh, oh I don't know um, uh, the eastern shore of Connecticut, and he had been a a sailor, I suppose I would have been building model ships, <laughs> but it was uh, trains all the way for me from the very beginning. It was good fortune that your grandfather, with, you know, with that, what a career! Fifty six years doing, doing working for the same place. That's that's absolutely yeah. amazing, and just almost that, that's unheard of nowadays. Exactly, I mean, nobody you know, does five that to anymore. Six years, maybe, but not fifty six years. That's that's certainly an amazing accomplishment. I know it really was, and uh, he was dedicated to it. He was very good to it. Uh, very good for him, and he was good to the railroad, and they were they were good to him. It worked out well. It, it did. He made a, a a comfortable living, and because of he had uh, hired out uh, just before World War One, and so mm-hmm. because he was an essential worker, he avoided uh, World War One, and then oh. by that time he was too old for World War Two. By the time that came around, so he stayed out of two wars and. Uh, Worked on the home front, moving freight for uh, for two wars. So you got this passion for model railroading, obviously, for your love for your grandfather. I can appreciate that. I'm very close to my grandfather. Uh, so I, I definitely get that and, and, and how that can happen. When do you start to get your hands on some model railroad stuff and, and, and start to enter that journey? Well, my father was very good, knowing the passion and, of course, the fact that he, he had also grown up around railroads since that's what his father did. Um, it was not long before uh, my first train was a, a wooden train, you know, much like the uh, Thomas the Tank Engine sort of thing now with wooden track. And, yep. you know, I think it was made by Strom Becker, which was an old toy manufacturer way back in the day. It was a wooden train. And from that, I went to a wind-up train Mm. where you'd have a wind-up key on the locomotive, and that would carry me. They carry the locomotive around uh, 027 track. And then I went to uh, the next train I bought was Marx, M-A-R-X, Lewis Marx and Company. Yep. I still have that. Oh, awesome. Uh, I still have that train in its original, <laughs> its original yeah. box. Awesome. And uh, then I graduated to Lionel, yep. and... Uh, when that wasn't realistic enough for me, I I transitioned to HO, and I was already beginning to be interested in HO scale because I just wanted things to look real. Mm. I didn't want them to say Lionel Trains on the side. I wanted right. them to, to say Seaboard Line or Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe or Sunoco or whatever it was on this. And yeah. um, uh, I remember... You know, again, I was searching for realism, and 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 uh, I didn't have enough room for O, and so the H O came along, and I thought, wow, this is it. And I must have been about twelve when I got my first my first things. I still ran 
played with the Lionel here and there, but by the time I was about 13 or 14, the Lionel was completely gone, and I would, I started with things like Varney and Ulrich mm-hmm. and Mantua yeah. Yeah. and um, things like that, uh, at Roundhouse right. uh, models, and... Um, and, but what I was, I, I knew I wanted realism because uh, in um, even when I was doing the Lionel, I used to, uh, I wanted to dull down the sheen of the cars, and so I took my, I took the baby powder and and, and brushed that on the sides of the car to dull the sheen on the plastic, so the cars would yeah. look used. So my yeah. uh, my Lionel train smelled like a baby's bottom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> smells good, looks good, too. Smell, smells good and look good. <laughs> yeah. So I started, you know, putting talc on the side of... <laughs> that, was, nice. uh, that was my weathering back in yeah. the day when yeah. I was 10. So I just, you know, and I wanted to get down to eye level, and I, so, you know, uh, I, I wanted... I just wanted things to look good, and I did not like to race my trains around the the track uh, like uh, slot cars. Uh, I wanted, you know, prototypical speeds and all that sort of stuff. But you know, that gets pretty pretty boring when you basically got an oval of track. So, uh, and it was not, and I had nothing permanent. The permanent layout uh, began with HO scale when I guess I was still. I'd say about in seventh grade, and okay. that was your standard. I forget was there was four by eight or five by nine yeah. uh, layout uh, in the basement, and be, and it was it was boring because I I had it was yet another oval of track only this time it was a double track oval you know oh, nice. yeah. based on the Santa Fe main line and from Chicago to Kansas City and so I had double track but it was still boring right you know uh I really didn't appreciate uh uh operations and uh and and how exciting that could make a, a railroad um so uh I tired of that and found found girls and uh, sports in uh, yeah. in high school and never entirely gave it up. I'd go downtown or downstairs in the basement and occasionally run run a train or two, but it definitely took a back seat to other things. But um, the railroading never entirely left me, uh, Ray, because I found myself. Even when I was a young actor, uh, our, I went to the University of Illinois at Chicago, mm-hmm. and I could go, and our the-, the theater we used was actually right off of Michigan Avenue uh, and 11th Street. It was called the 11th Street Theater, mm-hmm. Michigan Avenue 11th, and if you know anything about Chicago, the, the Central Station, the Illinois Central Station was right at 12th in Michigan, mm-hmm. and so I could walk across the street to Grant Park to learn lines and in the meantime watch the uh, Panama Limited or the city of Miami being made, a city of New Orleans being made up uh, for the uh, for the departure. And just, um, you know, and it wasn't, and I could, I could walk from the school to our theater and cross, uh, uh, cross the tracks of LaSalle Street Station and Dearborn Station and um, uh, Union Station and the B and O C and O stations before I wow. got so you know I I I would purposely uh, walk to the theater, which was a couple miles, uh, and and cross all those tracks just so I could see any activity. I wasn't an active model river at the time, but it was even at the time I was a young actor and far more interested in oh I don't know Shakespeare and. Yep. And learning my trade, and and of course, int- very much interested in young actresses. Um, <laughs> I never lost. I never lost that uh, that wonder for for trains, and I would try and build them into my daily walks. Or, and I remember when I went up to. <laughs> it's funny. I just thought about this. I went up to summer stock in college, and went to a went to a theater out in northwestern Illinois. And the theater is still operating, a wonderful sort of non-equity, you know, non-union theater, where okay. I made a grand total of $15 a week in room and board. Ooh. And um, 
live so frugally, I came home with money in my pocket at the end of the summer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was my working class background, right? Yeah, right. Uh, but you could get it. You could also get a pitcher of beer for a you know a dollar or two in those days. So I didn't know there was nowhere to spend my fifteen dollars a week. <laughs> so um, uh, because you know the meals were free. Yeah. Um, so um, I uh, after a show at night, let's say we'd come down at uh, uh, maybe. Curtain time was 8 o'clock. We'd be down by 10.15 or something like that. I would get out of my wardrobe as quickly as possible and yep. get, in a, get in a car with somebody or borrow a, borrow a truck and, um, and, uh, and go down to a crossing, a railroad yep. crossing that was due south of the theater, about three miles, a rural mm -hmm. crossing, and watch, I don't even know what train this was, watch a CB and Q streamliner oh, barrel wow. through that crossing at 80 miles an hour, a rural crossing, <laughs> horn blaring and shaking yep. the ground like crazy. And I used to take girls down there. I said, what are you, what are you doing? I said, wait, you just wait, you wait, wait till you see it. You know, and way in the background, you'd see the, you'd see the Mars light, maybe a, you know, you know, quarter of a mile away, you know, just right. sh shining into the sky and here and there, and a, and you'd begin to hear it, and then suddenly it was on top of you, the full fury of those uh, beautiful shovel-nosed E units and beautiful yep. C, B, and Q uh, stainless steel bearing down on you, and of course I'd wave, and he'd, you know, the engineer would honk, and that train went by in a matter of seconds right and i think it was it was going on to savannah i think probably the twin cities mm -hmm. uh savannah illinois and up the mississippi towards the twin cities yeah and i was just mesmerized i try and get out of the theater in time to run down to that rail crossing yeah. and uh i was what 20 20, 21 years of age, and I'd have to get down to that crossing just to see that train go by and uh, shake the ground beneath my feet. And I don't know, dream dream a little. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it's a familiar story. I mean, I need that, you know, coming out of the theater, but just that, that thrill of being trackside and, you know, how it all ties together, the model railroading railroad, you know, the, the prototype, the, you know, and that thrill of, of just, seeing that and boy did you get to see an awesome the, a golden era in, in railroading through through all that mm -hmm. I and mean, we can kind of mm -hmm. see that now i could go down to the northeast corridor and let an acela speed by me at 80 but it ain't the same as rural america and just that thrill of it sneaking up on you kind of feeling you know that's just that's really a, a cool opportunity well yeah it was because i remember the background noises were a lot of cicadas and and crickets yeah. and things like that and uh and uh, hog pens, where you'd hear the hogs with their snouts would uh, would eat and push aside a piece of sheet metal to eat, and then the sheet metal would drop when they'd re remove their snout from the uh, feeding yep. pen, and you'd just hear the the clank of that feeding pen at night. And yeah. but otherwise, uh, quiet, you know. Except for, I mean, to be honest with you, there was there was a lot of night sound in terms of just p insects. And then yeah. it would all be broken by the sound of that uh, that train coming through. Awesome, yeah. awesome stuff. So you're going through college. You're, you're talking about this. You're doing. Uh, you're building basically your career, and 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 you're uh, going through all that. And you said that mo you know, obviously the railroading's kind of still a piece of that. When does model railroading re-enter your life? Well, um, it never entirely. Left, I remember when I was, well, I I was always finding a way to work it into my life uh, yep. in some ways. Whether that was, I remember when I was working the, my first jobs out of, uh, it's funny how people still, I went to the School of Drama at, at Yale University. After I graduated from the University of Illinois, I went to graduate school at Yale and got a Master of Fine Arts in acting there and people there i guess i must is still 
I don't remember talking about it that much, but they still associate me with trains. People from those days will say, every time I hear a train, two longs is short and a long, I think of you. <laughs> that's, that's great. That, that's, uh, there, there's other worse things to be remembered yeah, exactly. by. That's, that's a pretty good one, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly. And and yeah. then when I was, um, I moved on to um, uh, you, you know, legitimate theater after mm-hmm. after graduation and was three years, for example, in Louisville, Kentucky, and I always found a way to go down to the old uh, L and N uh, station in Louisville, or and, and watch a little activity, maybe on a day off, or um, uh, uh, find somebody who could hitch me a ride on a on a switch engine uh, on, a, on a weekend <laughs> night or something, yeah. you know. Uh, I, I you know talk my way into the cab of a switch engine, uh, and. Uh, and then when I was uh, doing very little modeling, but I started, I started actually um, uh, uh, collecting a little bit of Rarity Anna in those days, okay. mostly yeah. dining car, uh, mostly dining car china and silver from the uh, Atchison and Topeka and Santa Fe. Uh, okay. And um, but I was building models when I I was at a theater in Minneapolis, the Guthrie Theater is the name of it. And a wonderful regional theater up in the Twin Cities, and I remember finding a local hobby shop there. I fir- bought my first uh, airbrush there and started uh, spraying floquil in the house, which I do not recommend. Yeah, that's um, not a good idea. No, no, no. <laughs> but I did buy myself a respirator. No, I, I bought a respirator and uh, my first airbrush, and I built a beautiful little wooden label kit. Yeah. Uh, back in the day, that was when I was still, again, I was a professional actor at this point, working in repertory theater and still finding a little time here and there to uh, to sit and build a model or two. So, uh, and then I started getting really more, yeah, I, remember, <laughs> I remember a friend of mine when I was living, years later when I was living in New York before the days of Family Ties, doing theater, Broadway, off-Broadway, this sort of thing, and the odd television movie. My upstairs neighbor said, what do you think this is ever going to amount to? you sitting here building these little kits. What is, you sure you want to do this with your life? Well, years later, I took that same gentleman and his and his wife on a, on a, on a private car journey. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I said, see, we're building those models. We'll get you, my friend. There you go. <laughs> I said, we, we, uh, we went to L.A. Uh, I had done some uh, Operation Lifesaver videos for the Ashes in Topeka and Santa Fe and some promotional videos for them. And they said, how can we repay you? And I said, uh, with one of your private cars, L.A. to Chicago and back. <laughs> and, nice. they, and by golly, they did it. And so I took my friend, I took my friend and I said, see, this is where those models lead someday if you're smart. Right. right. <laughs> so yeah, enjoy the enjoy ride, that. courtesy yeah. of uh, the, the guy who used to fiddle with models in his uh, little apartment in New York City. Now, you, we had talked about prior to the hit and record here that you had actually worked for the railroad as well. When did that, when did that happen? Oh, right. That's right. Um, yes, I, um, well, I had to get it out of my system somehow. Uh, I had, of course, wanted to work dearly for the for the Ashes in Topeka and Santa Fe, right. and I had this great idea that I was going to work aside my grandfather in this little town in Iowa, yeah. which was a division point where he worked. He 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 was in the he was in the yards. He was a engine herder, a switch engine foreman, and all that sort of thing. Never went out on the road. He went home to his own bed every night, yeah. and. Um, uh, I thought, well, I'm just going to invite myself there for the summer and work for the Santa Fe because he used to tell me they hire all these college kids in the summer. Yeah. Well, it never occurred to me. I loved him and just assumed that I would be the most incredible guest in his home for an entire summer. It was not <laughs> a big house. And he he came to me. He called me one day and said, oh, I'm sorry. All the All the positions are taken. All the yeah. positions taken, and I, I, there's just nothing for you here in 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 this town, and I'm sorry to say that. And 
I realized years later, I thought, well, of course, my he and my grandfather, my grandmother sat down together and she said, I mean, I love our grandson, but I can't have him here underfoot <laughs> for th- for the entire summer living in our house with us. It was a two bedroom house, you know, right. and they were, you know, in their 60s. And I somehow just assumed because I was the much beloved grandson that I could move in with him for months. And of course, he he he, he kind kindly he let me down easily by just saying. Instead of yeah. saying, you know, we don't want you here for three months. That was he, the nice way of putting it. He said, oh, yeah. gee, all the positions are taken. Well, <laughs> and, uh, I mean, you know, I. Grandson. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, I was terribly disappointed because I would have worked for the Santa Fe. But I also thought, by golly, I, I just I, I want to work for the railroad. So that was the summer of 1967. And. Um, I um, I applied to all the local railways in Chicago, the Chicago Northwestern, the Milwaukee Road, the Belt Railway of Chicago, any any place else that would uh, would take me. And um, lo and behold, I I found out where the uh, well I, I I thought it wouldn't be f- most mostly they were hiring brakemen, you know, and things like that, brakemen, switchmen uh, for summers for cover people's vacations and all that sort of stuff. Sure. And extra boards only. Right. But I mm-hmm. uh, I somehow located the master mechanics office, which was right beneath the uh, Un- uh, Chicago Northwestern Station. And it was kind of on my way home. And so I'd go there and say, well, what are you, what are you hiring here? He says, well, we hire the engine crews, firemen and all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And I says that's how, that sounds great. That's what I want to do. <laughs> and, <Right>. uh, <laughs> uh, and there was a huge. I remember a huge stack of applications. He said, "See that stack? I'll get to you when that stack is, you know, down to the desk level." And there must have been fifty. Oh, I don't know, fifty fifty applications there, and it was just ridiculous. But I would go. I would stop there on my way home from school. That is to say, college day and a couple times a week and go to this master mechanics office and how are we doing are we getting any closer and i think finally one day just to get rid of me he said okay you're all right i think i gotta i I can i can find you something because i just think i was annoying enough you know that he said well geez this guy really wants it and so he couldn't have gone through 50 applications that quickly i just think he wanted to i was just i was just annoying yeah. And so to get say, rid of it's either it's either persistence or or pestiness, which, which I one think was. I think a little bit of both. <laughs> and bit, and he know. just yeah. thought I was I was, uh, you know, he was having a nice, nice, quiet days sitting in that office by himself, except for me. And yeah. so um, so he finally said, OK, I'm going to have you report to the company doctor and this, that and the other thing. And uh, well, the next thing you know, I was a card carrying member of the. Brotherhood of Locomotive Firemen and Enginemen, nice. uh, which was later absorbed into the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers, and um, probably one of probably one of the last members because I don't think that union <laughs> lasted much longer. They were in direct comp- yeah. competition in a way. It was basically the firemen's union, yep. and then there was the engineers' union, and they were finally absorbed. And of course, now it's all one big UTA, and then they were. Mm-hmm finally absorbed by the sheet metal workers or some other crap. I can't keep track of it anymore. <laughs> but um, uh, I, uh, uh, yeah, I was a member of the Brotherhood of Locomotive Firemen and Enginemen, the B of L, F, and T, and E. Nice. And um, was an extra board fireman wow. uh, for the summer of 1967. And um, I basically, I, I needed to get it out of my system, and it was good. It was good pay. Of course, my life wasn't my own. Right. Uh, as a as a uh, as an extra board uh, worker, right. uh, I could. And it was a busy summer, and not infrequently, I'd call the call call board person and say, "Well, I'm just uh, you know tying up here here or there," and he'd say, "Well, 
get the hell out of there and get to sleep. I'm calling you in probably eight hours again. So wow. get get the hell out of there and yep. get get some sleep because you'll be up soon. Um, you know, between vacations and sick leave and all that other sort of stuff, it was summer. And uh, to be honest with you, I learned some stuff as a, as a locomotive fireman and very much enjoyed it and tried to make myself useful. I really did. I had enough pride in the work to uh, learn what I had to and take a good look around the locomotive before the engineer got there. It was pretty much expected that I would get there first and look yeah. at the fuel and oil levels and uh, and 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 water and make sure there was uh, 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 drinking water and uh, a block of ice and a <laughs> yep. and a nice in an ice chest for us up in the cab and and things were working properly. But I also learned some troubleshooting too because in 1967 uh, there was a lot of first generation stuff uh, mm -hmm. uh, F7s and uh, uh, E units and. Uh, uh, I worked on uh, RSD four and fives and Jeep sevens, and awesome. there was some stuff that was held together with baling wire. And my only regret is I didn't carry a camera in those days, <laughs> <laughs> because those were those would have been precious memories. You know, just had my my grip and my timetable and my rule book and a thermos and lunch, and would hoist it up in the cab and go to work. In some ways, I wished because there wasn't enough for me to do. Mm -hmm. You know, you're calling signals and this and that and watching out on your side of the train and trying to make yourself uh, trying to make yourself useful. I thought it would have been much more interesting to be a, a brakeman because yeah. they got more exercise. They were out on the ground uh, right. doing things. Uh, I worked a lot of freights where we'd uh, drop off and pick up cars and things like that. And I always thought. Oh boy, he gets to climb down and walk a little bit while I'm sitting here. I mean, yeah. don't get me wrong; it was a, it was a, a, a job I very much enjoyed, but there were times I just wanted to get a little more exercise. And my grandmother would always say, "Your, uh, your grandfather outlived all the, uh, all the engineers because they sat on their asses for most of their <laughs> career right. and they." get heart attacks and get get overweight and so forth and on. Your grandfather, you know, he lived into his 90s because he was always on the ground and getting exercise, climbing ladders and this and that and walking up and down cuts of cars. Yeah. And um, and I began to feel that way in the locomotive saying, uh, you know, I, I could use a little exercise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as much as I enjoyed, yeah. I mean, you know, come on, yeah. being in the head of a... Uh, an F7 or a, an, an E at full throttle was pretty damned exciting. Oh, I can imagine. Uh, yeah, like but I, but uh, the head brakeman got that thrill too. You know, to no, be yeah. honest with you, when you're on a freight, so he was yeah. up there too, and he, he got to walk around a little bit too, which was, uh, you know, I like my exercise even to this day. Yeah, but I imagine even, you know, just being able to do what you said, you you know, being, you know, up in the cab and getting to work for a railroad for a summer in a, in a in a role that was similar to what your grandfather had done and just probably made you feel all that much closer to him. Just saying that I, I'm a railroader, too, you know, and, and having that connection. I, I, I did. I did. I was and and uh, proud of what I learned. I learned, uh, I think I may have mentioned some troubleshooting. Here and right. there, because there'd be things you'd have to. Uh, there was one time we were, I was working on an, working on an E unit. Actually, I was just deadheading mm -hmm. and uh, sitting in a in an unoccupied coach, deadheading back to Chicago from somewhere. And this, uh, the train kept stopping, and uh, we. It was one of the scoots, as they call them, the commuter trains. It was uh, heading to Chicago. Uh, pushing, yep. uh, being pushed by a, a locomotive, and um, we'd stop. And this, I'd see the fireman walk back to the locomotive. He'd walk through my. I was the only one in the coach. I was one one of these empty coaches, just just uh, sitting and deadheading on my way home. And uh, I finally said, "What's going on?" Yeah. You know, when he stopped about the second or third time, and he said, "Right, the shutters are not opening uh, to." Uh, 
uh, the side shutters are not opening. We can't get them open. And mm-hmm. the engine's overheating. And yep. we have to keep stopping. And I said, well, let me take a look at it. Well, some old head had showed me a trick to get the shutters open uh, yep. using a, a cap of a fusee and, uh, un, you know, un, unscrewing some little valve and putting the cap of a fusee in it and screwing it back on and the shutters open. And this, this guy who had years on me, I was just there in the summer, said, how the hell did you learn that? <laughs> I said, I've just been watching and listening. Watching, said, listening, paying yeah, attention. Yeah. Watching, listening. And I said, I just wanted to make myself useful all the time. And he said, I can't imagine you've just been here a couple months. He said, I didn't know how to do that. And I was so I felt so proud of myself because I thought, well, I kept this train running that day. And, you know, we were behind schedule yeah. <laughs> naturally by that time. But I said, well, I, I did my part to keep to keep the train running just by this stupid little trick i learned uh, a little workaround yeah. uh, mechanically to uh, to open the, sh- the the shutters along the 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 far grills you know and all that yeah. sort of thing yeah. anyway um so I, I i i took pride in it i really did i i and i still by golly i still get Oh, I still get ticked off when a train's late. I just, I have too much pride, you know. And I know, I know it's not Amtrak's fault. I know yep. it's not, right? Because they, they, they're, they're, they're subject to the whims of the, of the freight railways. But I just, oh yeah, I just take it personally. I just, I want to yeah. be on time and like those commuter schedules we had. Uh, yeah. But of course, we owned the track, and so we controlled it in a way that Amtrak oh, yeah. doesn't. So, but right. I just. I get ticked off. I, I guess have too much pride. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, 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 one year, but you, you, you did. You, you took it seriously. You paid yeah. attention. You learned a lot, and yeah, and then you can you can say that you were you were a railroader, and you've got the you got the union card in your pocket, and that's a really cool experience. Yeah, still still keep that stuff. I've got the you know the timetable and the uh, now. Of course, in those days, one of the reasons I think I'm, I tried to make myself uh, useful was. Um, I felt a little embarrassed because uh, they had started started getting rid of firemen, uh, but the state of Wisconsin in 1967 had what they they called a full crew law, meaning you had to on a freight train you had to have five employees on that freight train, you wow. had to have the engineer, mm-hmm. fireman, head brakeman. And in the caboose, you needed a conductor and a rear brakeman. You had to have five people on that crew. And, yeah. of course, every other, you know, you, well, aren't you just a feather better? All that sort of thing. And I said, no, <laughs> damn it, I'm going to make myself useful. I'm a, there you go. Uh, uh, I'm here for a reason. Uh, yeah. Not just, you know, safety, having two men in a cab, which I still believe in, mind you. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't fly an airplane, which... Uh, you had, I don't care if you've got a dead man's pedal and all that other sort of stuff. Uh, I don't right. like I don't like having one person in in, in a speeding locomotive. Um, I, I so, um, and I wanted to I wanted to learn the learn the trade. Yeah. So uh, so I tried to make myself useful so I wouldn't just excess baggage or a feather better. I thought I've got too much pride for that. Yeah. <laughs> that's for sure that's what an awesome experience and you know to, to be able to again to to be able to do this the work even just like i said a summer it's just amazing that you know things that don't seem to happen anymore you know that that, that kind yeah. of experience so yeah and i um uh, uh, the next summer i was at that that theater yeah. that i just that was the summer of 68 at that theater where i had to go down and uh, at the end of a show and get my kicks just listening to a, a, a fast train roll by on a, at a rural crossing. Right. So um, the summer before I'd worked for the railroad and that next summer I had to somehow be close to the rails in some way, even though I was, I, I was on stage every night. Right. So you're starting to, you know, you're putting your acting career together. You talked about that and, and then some of the theaters that you started to do before you, you know, before the, like you said, family ties right, and, right. and whatnot. How does it, you talked about model railroad and kind of still kind of carried with you in those years, right? Yeah. I never, uh, I never had a layout because I was, mm-hmm. I was 
pretty much a gypsy, yeah. transient. Um, mm-hmm. I had built a few model. I had built some models, and I collected some of the Rarityana again, chiefly ATSF. Uh, uh, dining car, silver and china, just, you know, a couple place settings and things like mm-hmm. this, that stuff that I could get for a song in those days sure. uh, because they were still running a railroad um, and uh, it wasn't quite so rare. Um, but the interest was always always there and I was maybe building something, as I say, like that LaBelle kit or working on other things. I you know, my friends would kid me, you know, <laughs> you, what are you doing? Yeah. Playing with all those little parts. <laughs> no, it, and, and, you know, and it's, it, what's, what's neat about it. And, you know, I think you, you probably had found this too, is as you're building kits or you're doing these, it, it's, it's a mental exercise too. It's just this, this stress relief and, a, you know, to, be, to take out a different level of create, you're doing creativity in the, in the acting side, but there's a creativity to this modeling as well, the skills and, and the things you hone in and recreating. I think they kind of tied it, but they're, you know, a different part of, of creativity. You're you right. It's more of a, more of a manual, you know, manual dexterity and problem solving in 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 different ways and uh my wife still doesn't understand you know when i commit myself to sitting at a workbench for hours she'll say within two minutes of sitting in a traffic jam you have completely lost patience (laughs) how can you sit here how can you sit here for hours fiddling with little bits of plastic and metal? And I said, because I'm accomplishing something. I am right. not accomplishing a damn thing in a traffic jam. I'm sitting there <laughs> at yeah. full stop. Yeah. But yeah. here, even though it's crazy and I'll drop something on the floor and then spend five or seven minutes searching the floor for the part I dropped. <laughs> That's I how I said, spend most of my time is you know, right, looking for right. little pieces on the floor. Right? I'm actually accomplishing something in between crawling on moments of crawling on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas a traffic jam gets me nowhere. It's so unproductive. <laughs> That's right. Maybe the maybe the way to solve traffic in LA is just to, you know, if everybody had a model kit with them, maybe they feel a little better, right? Well, I've actually taken things on the road too. Uh, for example, not to the not to the extent of somebody like Rod Stewart, who you know <laughs> right. can have his own private plane and uh, engage an entire hotel room for his model making, adjoining right. his own room, you know, en right. suite. Um, mm-hmm. I will take occasionally models on the road that just need mm-hmm. simple things done. Um, yeah. I'll take a bit of uh, a bit of uh, wire and this and that. And I'll, I can and drills and simple tools, and I can insert uh, aftermarket uh, 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 stirrup steps, as they call them, or you know, yeah. the, uh, um, uh, uh, brake detail underneath. Uh, I can do simple things like that. Now I'm not going to bring paints with me in an airbrush and all that no right, none of the right. none of the finishing materials but things i can do simply right. i will sometimes bring them bring bring some things along and in my hotel room you never know for example on a film shoot they may say suddenly in the you've got three four days off wow. you know between you know on the film schedule will say well we're just not shooting you know, at that location and your scenes. So you've got some time off. And usually I know that ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Get a a look at the schedule before this happens. So I thought, well, you know, I can, I can tour around and get to know the town, but you know, Mm -hmm. do I, and I do other things. I go out to the theater or whatever, but, uh, and explore some restaurants, but for hours I can just unpack my stuff and sit at a, most hotel rooms have a little desk and I can sit there with that desk and spread right. out, take out, take out one of their little hand towels to make myself a nice little white space to lay yep. out my stuff on, on top of the desk, uh, where I can, uh, see things. And, uh, uh, I'm, I'm very happy. I can just devote, devote my time and maybe, maybe do a complete, uh, AB brake system on a couple of yep. cars. Uh, nice. You know, simple, simple things, uh, uh, adding, you know, corner grabs or, uh, uh, you know, stuff like that. 
you know, sim- yeah, simple. So. A drill, a drill, a, a couple pairs of pliers, wire, uh, a couple other parts. You know, eye bolts and stuff like that. You're in, you're in business, right? Right. Busy sure. work. Yeah, that's right. Enough to you know, keep you occupied. I did the same thing. I, I worked on the road and uh, as a salesman, and I was out, you know, maybe three or four nights a week. And those hotel rooms, after so much of you know flipping through the t- channels and stuff, there's need something to do. And I, I would do the same thing: bring kids mm-hmm. out, and mm-hmm. definitely helps pass the time. So, but when you're back in your workshop, one thing I know and I noticed that you like, and you're you, you're got a little bit of a knack for uh kit bashing and scratch building don't you well to a degree um i go i love prototype modeling mm-hmm. i will be for example um no, i don't go to every every show all the time i yep. will be at uh the naperville RPM in October. I think it's the last weekend in October in Chicago. And then yep. one of the reasons I go there is I, I'm a Chicagoan and yep. I have friends I will see. And I'm going back to do some business at my university as well there too. I'm seeing some people there. Um, so Naperville is always a good place for me to go that, that RPM. Um, I love learning from other exceptional modelers uh uh troubleshooting how to do this how to do that uh there's so many great people particularly amongst these prototype modelers i myself would not call myself a prototype modeler uh i'm an illusionist just as i am on stage right you know uh Stage people believe if you paint something black, it's invisible. You know, you don't see it. <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, I'm accustomed to working in front of in 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 rooms that are not real rooms, in front of facades that are not real buildings. Yeah, uh, wearing <laughs> wearing wardrobe pieces that are not my own. <laughs> and so <Right. laughs> there is something there's something about illusion that I very much appreciate. And so I don't have to have every last detail the way some i don't build models as to every model as a contest winner or a potential contest mm-hmm. winner there are certain things i like to see i like to i like freestanding grab irons uh um uh s- steps that will uh, uh that will handle rough handling um mm-hmm. you know metal couplers uh KDs, um, yep. um, and I like a certain amount of underbody detail because what I do like is um, is being able to get down at a spectator level. I like taking photographs of models, getting down to a uh, an HO scale pedestrian level, and right. looking at a freight car. And I love seeing the things hanging underneath. I want to see those rods. I want to see the chain. Yep. Uh, I want to see that brake detail beneath a car. So I will take, you know, an ex- you know, a, a car like a, well, let's say a ready to run KD, and I'll mm-hmm. rip out all the stuff beneath it because it's 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 plastic and it it doesn't have the right profile. The uh, the two um, uh, the the two rods up to the up to the trucks go at a diagonal whereas they're pretty much horizontal on an actual freight car and so i want to see that horizontal Mm -hmm. look of uh, of the rods and things like that and so one of the things i will almost always devote myself to is is um, completing that underbody detail so it looks right to me from a ho scale pedestrian now but I'm, I hasten to add, I'm not a prototype modeler. It may, it may have a, a a W corner post instead of a you know the freight car, or it may yeah. have a diagonal panel roof instead of a Viking roof. Well, maybe mm-hmm. not. I wouldn't go that far. If it has a Viking <laughs> roof, I'd have a Viking roof. But you know, right. um, maybe it doesn't. I don't know. Maybe it it, it doesn't have the perfect roof or something. You know, not quite right, but to me, it's it's about the illusion, right? And everybody has to decide. I know a wonderful uh, uh, model railroader with whom uh, 
you'll 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 never have a uh, you'll never have an interview because he 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 doesn't talk to people. He just he's busy with his trains all the time. He doesn't want to talk about right, it. Right. He just wants to do it. His name is. Yeah. Bob Hayden, and he used to be an editor with the uh, Model Railroader and uh, with Kalmbach for years. And uh, Bob Hayden is just a marvelous railroader, and half the stuff he's got there is is uh, well, a great deal of stuff he has is AccuRail cars. He doesn't have freestanding grabs on that. He does, but he wants to operate. He doesn't yeah. want to. He doesn't want to replace every grab iron. He's got too right. much. Uh, too much rolling stock to do that. I'd rather, right. with me, I'd rather have less rolling stock and 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 it fix certain things. Again, not to prototype model or contest level, mm-hmm. but I like to see freestanding grabs and other things like that. So he will just weather these things so beautifully that from the average spectator distance, it looks like a resin kit, you know. Right. And this is stuff out of the box. It's just weathered beautifully. He hasn't added a lot to it, except for the weathering and maybe chalk marks and a few other things like this. That it's it's just it, it looks beautiful. Um, so um, everybody has to decide what's good enough for them. Uh, right. You know what level of detail what they what what are they if they want to operate? You can't build every car to a fairly well you you'll never you'll never get stuff out on the road right, right you know you'll you'll be spending time researching it for weeks before you even touch it right do i have all the right photographs do i have the drawings you know yeah should i look in the you know I just it's just know. it's just a, it's just an, again it was like the hobby within a hobby kind of stuff of model railroading and I think one of the more fascinating things about this hobby is there's so many points of entry and there's so many different levels you can choose absolutely you can be that rivet counter or you can be some of its operations and you know this is okay or somewhere in between it's just so many different ways to be involved with it there are people who will never Never take the shine off a boxcar. They take it ready to run out of the out of the package and put it on the railroad, and it's their railroad, and they can do as ever they please, and I applaud them. Right. Uh, um, there are people who concentrate on, on scenery. There are people who are whizzes at electronics. I am not one of them, <laughs> uh, and so I go to them for help. Right. Um, they're interested in – or people are interested in structures, and um, – uh, you know, you can find your particular niche in this in this uh, modeling community. That's that's one of the beautiful things about the the hobby. Yeah. So before we get going here, I, I don't. I want to know more about you, you. Talked about you have a layout. You talked about it in the pre-show. I want to know what? a little bit about what your layout is <laughs> oh, because okay. you said you're, you're in the fifties. You're in Kansas. Tell us about it. Well, I have to. I'm going to. First of all, I'm going to disappoint you by tell you by telling you that I I'm a modular railroader. Okay. Okay. That's so, not disappointing. That's awesome. Well, yes and no. I mean, some I do not. Okay. By by the time it when I finally got. All your life, you dream about. You look at the pictures in the magazines, and you think, "Oh, I want an empire." Yeah. Right. Well, by the time I could afford an empire and had the the space for an empire, I thought, oh, "Wow, I don't think I want this." Right. Um, I don't think I want to spend the rest of my life in my basement, never <laughs> never seeing my wife and my children. <laughs> uh, uh, and but not just that; it was the the the, the upkeep and care right. of 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 an empire. Um, uh, I, you know, I I chafe at the fact that I have to the upkeep I have on on own being a homeowner. There you know, go. oh, the gutters need cleaning, or this needs done, or there's this problem here, um, and so I thought. Gee, that won't be a lot of fun for me if that's if I'm constantly adjusting things and I and I have you know hundreds of square feet of railroad, and so I elected for modular railroading and became a Fremo modular. Yeah. I don't know if you know that uh, uh, yeah. Fremo is is basically a modular and international. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, organization uh, based on the compatibility of end plates, so you can uh, 
you can connect with anybody else who adopts that standard anywhere right. in the world. Uh, that is to say, the uh, uh, the electrical standard, the uh, design of the end plate, uh, the center line of the track, and all that sort of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. There are standards, and uh, if somebody uh, adheres to that standard, uh, you can get together with them and you know have have your empire for a weekend or right. you know for a show. And that, frankly, has been all I've wanted. I think my chief interest is uh, freight cars, uh, 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 detailing, weathering, right. freight. Um, uh, and I would rather have, again, I, I consider myself a branch line railroader. And uh, for years, of, I was one of those people who wanted everything, um, which means in Santa Fe, you have to have an El Capitan and a Super Chief and a this and a that and the other thing. And I said, oh, man, choose something. Narrow your focus. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I'm a branch line railroader who does not need a super chief, who does not need an El Capitan, who does not even need war bonded F units. Right. Uh, I have in 1954 zebra stripes, zebra stripes, yep. black, black and silver yep. stripes, and um, uh, and you know, and I have some some very late late steam, small small steam. Again, it's branch line railroading. So uh, I don't need long passenger trains. I need mixed trains. I'm as close as you can get to, I say to myself, I say to people, close as you can get to being a, a narrow gauge modeler and still call yourself standard gauge. <laughs> I like right. I like mixed trains and uh, uh, cabooses that, 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 that stand in as coaches as, as, as well, uh, carry a few passengers, uh, coaches that stand in as cabooses and carry a little way freight and i i'm not sure where i got that but i like granger railroading perhaps because oh i don't know i i spent my summers in in iowa and uh and i i, I loved the cb and q too because of course my great-grandfather worked for both of them and um I, the cb and q and the atsf both ran through the town where my grandfather lived and um but I love the Granger Railroads, the the Monon and the Wabash and the Chicago and Eastern Illinois and the Chicago Great Western and all those. I don't know. I I, I just something about it. Uh, the way small towns were held together in the golden age of railroads um, by uh, frequent frequent trains before before interstate highways and all that sort of thing. My father, you lived in a small town in Iowa, and he'd get on a train in the morning uh, and go to Quincy, Illinois, on a Chicago, yeah. Burlington, Quincy train to get his, to go visit the orthodontist. He was one of those unusual kids yeah. back in the yeah. 1920s who was actually getting his uh, teeth straightened, but there was none, none of no orthodontist in the little town in which he lived, so he'd get on the yeah. Get on the train, go visit the orthodontist, get his braces tightened, and come back on a, a later train. That's yeah. how people did it those days. And I love the idea of, oh, I don't know, people being held together by that sort of thing in a way that they, they're not quite held together anymore. Yeah. You know, it these was, uh, flyover, yeah. flyover places is what mm-hmm. they call that part of the world right, right now. Yeah. But you had to go through those places when I was a kid, and I still have a, a great affinity for... Uh, Small town America. I think in the last hour, we've definitely confirmed Michael Gross is a model railroader and is a railroader. He's not just a voice. We hear you. We've heard your voice mm-hmm. on the BNO historical societies. And again, you've narrated some stuff for the world's greatest hobby videos. You were a spokesperson for Operation Lifesaver, but you're not just a voice and a, and a good looking face. You actually know this stuff. And I'm just amazed by the knowledge that you have of, of model railroading and railroading. You're, you're, you are embedded in it. Well, Yes, to to yes, a, to a very great extent, but <laughs> yeah. um, but again, I there's so many other interests I have that again I was that person who couldn't make that final jump to an empire, to a yeah. complete basement. Um, my empire was is essentially nine feet in length, you know, uh, and great for photography and things like that, um, but uh, or a switching layout that kind of thing. But I. I, I, I couldn't 
my wife tells me I have commitment issues. Uh, <laughs> except for to her. She yeah, except committed for to her. her. Except for to her. Uh, <laughs> so that's all the commitment you can handle. That's all, guess, yeah, it? that's plenty for one lifetime. It's been there you go. some 40, 40 years. And awesome. uh, I, I, I just couldn't make that final leap. I enjoy visiting people who do love to do that and who, who have made that commitment and what a joy it is to uh, run on that uh, uh, railroad. When I go to Naperville, I will try to visit uh, uh, Bill Darnaby and his Maumee route, which is an extraordinary layout operated. But it's just what he's done is just mind-boggling, and it runs on timetable and train order and all that sort of thing. Again, that, that, that's another thing. Again, people... Uh, I was mentioning Bob Hayden, who used to work for years with. Uh, well, he he was he was with Kalmbach for years, but he made he basically I think he was known for a lot of narrow gauge railroading. Uh, Maine, he he uh, two two and a half foot gauge. I don't know, it was two and two and a half foot gauge. Uh, he ran a railroad for years called the Carabasset and Dead River. He was known for it when he was with Kalmbach, but he's now does Maine Central and. Uh, main line that connects with anyway long story short yeah. he doesn't like timetable and train order he yeah. said if i come if i come into my spare room i want to run trains i don't want to do paperwork <laughs> you know <laughs> so there's some people yeah again again yeah, yeah. there's some people who say time timetable and train order is the only way to go We've got to right. fill out. You've got to check with the telegrapher, and you've got to get that. And you've got to get your orders and all that sort of thing. Bob said, "I just want to move." You know, I've got instructions, and basically, he'll yeah. use you know car uh, car forwarding that kind of thing, the sort sure. of thing you the sort of micromart is known for. You know, yep. Um, but he says, "I I I I don't want to move paper when I'm here. I, yeah. I just want to I want to play with trains." Right. <laughs> and I don't want to move them around. But, but, but whether it's the way you operate or even with you, you're talking about your modular versus, you know, these guys with empires. Again, 100 different ways to do this hobby. That's the and beauty really, of it. And your modular really is kind of following a trend I'm starting to see with a lot of models, with, the, with the, what they call the shelf layout. Right. You know, guys that have shorter, smaller layouts, they don't have the big empires and, you know, places that are down south. They don't have basements, so they won't have places for this, but they may have a spare bedroom that they could put a small L ship layout in. So it all fits. And I think that's, you know, even even with a modular, it's it's fantastic. How often do you get to uh, get your modular out and into the clubs? I know. Well, I will take, uh, you know, the last time I did it was probably, what was it? Last, last fall, I want to say October, November, something like mm. that. And there's stuff, there's stuff coming out to be honest with you, entirely honest. I have just, I'm, I've just sold my module. I'm going to build something else. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I, I sold it to somebody else who really liked it and said, I, you know, uh, and I said, okay, all right, here's here's a price. Yep. And so uh, I'm 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 planning something else. Uh, awesome. I, I I think it will it may be simpler. Again, yeah. I, uh, um, uh, you know, I I just. And I'm getting, and I'm, and I'm at the point also in my life where I'm beginning to get rid of the kits I know I will never build. Yeah. Uh, you buy things because you think will never be available again, right? And to a, to some extent, yeah. that's true. Right. Uh, and then you think, all right, get real, get real. Uh, yeah. uh, what are you going to build? What are you What are you going to leave behind? And and it, it, that gets easier when you narrow your focus. Again, I've already told you. Mm -hmm. I sold my El Capitan some time ago. That's gone. Yeah. I don't need it. Right. Yeah. The the war bonded F units gone. I don't need need F unit freight. I'm right. I'm, I'm operating with uh, Flatlander Jeep Jeep sevens and uh, with, with no dynamic brakes and uh, you know just the simplest sort of stuff. And the more you focus, the more you narrow your interest uh the easier it gets in some ways because you don't have to buy everything right and you can you can really begin to say what do i really need here i've i'm i've 
brought a lot of beautiful Santa Fe reefers uh, when uh, when they first when they first came out in the in the eighties uh, through yes. Long's Drug Store and the <laughs> Inter the first Intermountain kits, and yeah. now I've gotten rid of gotten rid of most of my ute. Most of my right. reefers, I swear, right. I think I've got maybe two because um, I'm not running reefer blocks. I'm right. a, I, I, I'm wheat fields and corn. Uh, you know, right. I might have a reefer that was, you know, during the wheat rush was pressed into service as a way of just putting some more grain into something. But yep. um, I don't need it. Those yeah. beautiful, you know, we mentioned Rapido. I bought yeah. I bought four or five of those Rapido reefers and finally said, I don't need meat reefers. I'm not moving meat on this yep. railroad. Right. So, you know, there's some people who say they have to have everything. I'm not one of those people. I right. try to... Now, I'm the first to admit I have more than I do need. <laughs> like every ball <laughs> Yeah, we you all know, do. <laughs> you, you, uh. you, I can't look at a piece of wire or a, a, a bottle cap and say, gee, would that make a freight load? I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Will that make a flat car load? You know, can right. I throw that away or can I save that for a, f will that make a flat car load? It's ridiculous. You know, yep. you see a, some stupid tube and you think, well, how will that look in a gondola? You know, it's ridiculous. Right. You know, so you don't want to throw away a, a plastic straw for fear, for fear that it could be a gone load. Digging through the recycling out in the oh, kitchen. Oh, it's you know, crazy. What, what yeah, yeah. Well, I know, and I'm the first to admit I'm yeah. I'm nuts. I'm sometimes, uh, you know, I've spoken to several NMRA banquets and things like that. And I said, it's great to be surrounded by as many people who have obsessive compulsive disorder as I do. <laughs> and I said, I... I have the, the, at your table. Each of you will find at your plate a capsule of Prozac because we all need it. <laughs> we're, and then some. We're oh, yeah. all a little crazy, or we wouldn't be doing this. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But I, I, it's it's a good kind of insanity. That uh, boy, it's it's a rewarding thing, and and. Um, it certainly is great to, uh, again, I, I just think there's something very cool. I know you, you know, with you being you know, who you are and an actor and it's well known and, and seen and you're a model railroader too. And I think that's just really cool for all of us to be able to connect to that and say, you know, this, this isn't just some kind of, this is a lot of people do it a lot of more than we ever will know model railroad. Cause like you said, there are some guys that'll just do it and then never tell a soul. And they'll right. never mention it before. So it's just great to to hear from somebody, you know, again, well-known that, that loves this hobby. Right. I've got more of a public presence. Yeah. Outside, mm -hmm. outside of the modeling community. Right. Yeah. Right. Yep. So Michael Gross, it has been so awesome to talk to you here on Around the Layout. I appreciate your patience with me as we got audio issues squared away. We did awesome with that. Well, part of that was and my fault. No, yeah, I wasn't. Uh, yeah. I wasn't prepared, but you you walked me through it, and I I much appreciate that. And yeah, you know, for a, for a hobby that's brought me so much joy over so many years, and still brings me a great deal of satisfaction. It's it's just great to talk about it. And you know, actors love to talk about themselves anyway. No, uh, that's you right. know, we are as the old saying goes, the only hams that can't be cured. <laughs> No. <laughs> That's just, just like just like just like guys that you know, want to be radio podcasters that like to hear themselves talk so i think <laughs> we found some common ground tonight so michael thank you so much for being on around the layout it's an absolute pleasure ray and please let me know what it's on when it's going to be on and i'll mention it on my facebook uh facebook page and we'll see if we can get get some other people listening so thanks very much thank you for joining us for this episode of around the layout Learn more about today's show on our Facebook page, facebook.com backslash around the layout. Show your support by becoming an operating crew member at patreon.com backslash around the layout podcast. Past episodes and more can be found on our website, around the layout.com. And send us your feedback around the layout at gmail.com. Thanks for hanging out with us around the layout. Sit, Ubu, sit. Good dog.